Hello everyone, my name is Philippe and I will talk today about the ZIG programming language. ZIG aims to be a better C, nothing more, nothing less. It has about no innovation, it is quite verbose and it adds very few features. But guess what? That's why it's great. Uh, a fair warning before anything, I'll assume that you have some programming background and you know at least the basics of the C programming language. So ZIG isn't production ready yet. The ZIG team wants more fellow compiler developers to help them finish it and they aren't interested in new users just yet. That's why uh, there isn't much documentation. So keep in mind that if you like what you see today, you'll have to read the standard library source code to know how to use it. But hey, if I did it, you can too. And from my experience, both source code and developers are very friendly. So about this presentation, I will draw a quick overview of the ZIG project and then we'll jump on a lot of examples to show differences between ZIG and C. Uh, why am I comparing ZIG to C and not to X? If you want to know why I don't compare it to Rust or C++, there is a web page dedicated to this. Mostly, uh, ZIG aims to have a simpler and more readable language and since I will probably explain to you most of what you need to know to start programming in ZIG just with this video, I'm quite confident that it's true. So yeah, sorry C++ and a dozen ways to fuck up. For Go, Haskell, Python, uh, Perl and the others, they cannot be a replacement for the C programming language for technical reasons mostly memory management. Some cases are compatible with garbage collector, for example. Let's talk about the C programming language. C has a lot of pitfalls and arbitrary language limitations. Its standard library is limited and extra libraries are necessary for most tasks. C development environment and tooling are quite clunky and dispersed. Sharing code isn't as easy as it could be with uh, NPM, Go, Cabal, Stack, etc. Uh, C needs a preprocessor and it leads to many, many problems that we'll see later. And uh, C has multiple and incompatible uh, C libraries, leading to difficulties. Uh, to port programs from one system to another, even on the same platform, there can be difficulties. Alpine Linux, for example, is entirely compiled with Muscle instead of glibc, and they have to patch a lot of applications to to do so. Yes, C is 50 years old. A lot has changed between then and now, and I think that's we have enough insights now to do better. One way, as we'll see with ZIG, is to create a new but very familiar language. Another way may be to change the C language, as the people beyond libc called meaningless are doing. And since we won't rewrite uh, 50 years of applications, that's, I think, a valid approach. If you are interested, check out the link in description. So, finally, VIG. Here is a list of a few things that I think are nice, even if they don't represent a good enough reason to switch to VIG. So first, the Z compiler is a C and C++ compiler, with different C libraries included, which means that you can compile C and C++ code for any architecture and any operating system, of course, if your code is portable enough. Cross compilation is awesome, and this single line here is all you need 
to compile your code for a never-ending list of operating systems and architectures. I will give some examples later. Another good feature is that ZIG is C compatible, which means that you can write library that can be used directly in C and the other way around. You don't need foreign functions or bindings or whatever. Now are the game changers, at least to me. We'll see most of these concepts in details later. First, namespaces. When you import a library, it will be put into a constant. So that's dead simple yet big improvement. Optionals. An optional is a value that can exist or not, and it is better than using null pointers. It reminds me of uh, maybe in Haskell, but you can see this kind of stuff in C++ nowadays. Tests are a thing. You can now test your libraries or just some functions in your code just by using this keyword and a simple block of code. Zig doesn't need a preprocessor. The language has generic structures and reflection without macros. Then, error management is made through enumerations of errors and not integers, and users are forced to take errors into account, so you can be way more confident in your code, and we'll see that. Memory allocations are now managed in a modular way with allocators. These are abstractions to memory allocations to handle them in different ways, for example, by using a fixed buffer and not allocate any heap memory at all, or recording when allocations are made and freed to verify double free errors or leaks. Some allocators uh, have a thread safe version too. Also, in Zig, we can defer a block of code at the end of the function, and uh, this may not seem much. But combined with errors and memory allocations, it makes wonders. Finally, uh, the standard library brings a lot of goodies. Operating systems abstractions, uh, basic and not so basic structures, allocators, etc. And we can say that nothing really is new. We saw these features in many other languages before, but not this whole package. And it always comes with counterpart when you just want a C successor. So, yes, to me at least, Zig is C without the bullshit. Now, let's dig into some simple example of Zig versus C and we'll see that both are very similar. So, first example, a simple hello world. In C, we have an include and the main function. That's almost the same thing in Zig, except that all imported code is contained within the constant std right here. Uh, this is a simple namespacing system. Then our public function main returning void contains a single instruction, a single function call here, std.log.info. Parameters are a format, then the list of things to print, which is empty as in the printf in C. By default, Zig provides several ways to print stuff. In this case, I used log.info, but I could have used std.debug.print, for example, just like this. I won't get 
into details. Uh, Loris Crow did a video on this. A thing to remember is Zig doesn't provide default print since there are different considerations. Yeah, for example, do you want your print to be thread safe? Or do you need buffering? Answers to these questions won't be universal. So you have std.log and debug print with some assumptions and write your own if uh, it isn't enough. Next, numbers. Nothing much changed from C except for default types. And these are int and float, but you don't know their size. They change uh, depending on your operating system or architecture. So we often use other types defined in macros, just like this one or this one. In Zig, you can tell how many bits you want directly, like this, like this. Printing values doesn't require you to put the type in the format, as you can see here. That is computed at compile time. Also, for integers, you can ask for arbitrary sizes. In this case, I create a variable myVar. That is an unsigned 10-bit integer. As I put in comments, this can be great for reading and writing network packets, for example. Also, writing big numbers is easier in Zig, since we can put underscores and values, and it is a bit more consistent too. Next, overflows. We will see some basic operators. No big changes from C, except for one good thing. In C, overflows, like this one, are tricky for the unadvised. In this example, we have an unsigned integer with a zero value, and we subtract one. This isn't a valid operation uh, mathematically. Uh, result should be an error, but in C, the result is based on hardware implementation details. In Zig, the same operator produces an error. But since the C behavior actually is useful, new operators are implemented called wrapping operators. So for addition, subtraction, etc. This is great because now we know the difference when we accept overflows and when we don't. Next, booleans. In C, uh, the boolean type was added in C99. Nothing much to say, except that uh, true and false are just macros to one and zero, meaning that true plus one equals two, which is absurd. And that bool type actually is underscore bool. Again, uh, as we saw with integers, basic types in C have so much history, including headers to have basic types that may be macro to one or zero is just silly. Uh, that's 50 years of computer history for you. In Zig, we have the same thing except for Boolean operators and and or. I like keywords, so that's just fine to me. Next, arrays. In C, we declare a static array of five values this way. Beware that we can use size of to know the size of the array in memory, but it can be a key to compute its number of elements, and it only works for static arrays. Yeah, that's an hack to me. And you can write size of 
array, but you cannot write size of int. So yeah, so much wacky stuff here. In Zig, an array with undefined content is written this way. It is a variable name array with a type of array of five elements of a single byte inside. And the content is undefined. You can get the number of elements of the array with dot len, static or not. An array with defined values can be written this way. The size of the array is computed at compile time, so you can just put an underscore here. Another way of defining an array is this one. I admit, this is less obvious to read at first, this version allows you to put a value for each element and you can call a function to get it. Here is the function call. But you also can just put the value here, for example. Here is an array with full of zeros. A thousand of zeros. Next, we want to loop over values of an array. In C, we create an index from 0 to the max number of elements that we computed earlier. Classic. You can get each item of your array this way, or with an index. Or, if you want to modify the value of the elements, you can ask for a pointer on the items. This is mostly syntactic sugar, but you can communicate the intent. Next, let's see what we can do with uh, the arrays. In this example, in C, I don't put a default value in this element of the array. So I set and use the first element of the array, but when I access the second element, it is garbage. And we can have the exact same thing in Zig. Next, we have an array and ask for an element outside its range. In C, this leads to a garbage value, or maybe a sec fault if you are lucky enough. At least you know there is a problem. In Zig, this is a compilation error, and if this here happens at runtime, then you have a runtime error. So in Zig, arrays are simpler to use, and you have less conditions to write for the same result. If you get something wrong, you will know it. Errors are better than garbage values or sec faults. Next, we have pointers. There isn't much to tell. Uh, syntax is very, very slightly different. You can see this here. But otherwise, you know, that's pretty much the same thing. Next, we have slices. They are just a pointer and a size. You can see them as arrays with only a runtime known size. This simplifies the code. Next, strings. Strings in Zig are compatible with C. So both hello strings are the same in Zig and in C. As always, for static values, you don't need to write the type in Zig. A string isn't a simple array of unsigned bytes. As in C, strings have a sentinel value, but in Zig this is explicit in the type. This hello value is a pointer on a constant array of five elements of type unsigned 8-bit integer, and there is a sentinel value of zero at the end of the array. 
in any case, you'll get the right value, 5, when asking for the size. No need for this SLM. Next, we'll see structures. In C, structures are simple and very limited. In ZIG, as always, the syntax is quite similar. In this example, we can see uh, two main differences. First, structures are just a value that you can put into a constant here. Yeah. No special treatment. Then you can have uh, default values. You don't need to write it here. Next, structures can hold public constants like this. Also, they can have functions and it helps organize the code a little bit. It creates namespaces. There is no absolute need to have object-oriented programming. Having just namespaces actually is enough, at least for my needs. Next, we'll see our second built-in function, this. This refers to the current element you are in, the current structure. For example, we are creating here a point and within its definition we can refer to it as this. In this example we use a constant self to refer to the current structure. Having a self constant within a structure is a common practice self is later used in the function set for the first argument here a pointer on the current structure let's see how the structure is used first we create an instance of structure point named p here then we use the set function we saw earlier as we can see, the first argument of the function is implied to be the p variable. There, the same stuff in C. <coughs> this syntax isn't a big change. Still, it is simpler to use than in C. This adds namespaces and then function names become simpler since they are bound to the structures I work on. Simple, not new by any mean, yet powerful. Now that we saw that C and Zig aren't much different, and even if the syntax changes a bit, it still is very familiar, Zig is easier to write and read, despite doing almost the same thing. Zig does add extra instructions like storing array lengths, but you had to do that anyway, so it was only logical to do that automatically in a consistent way. Now let's take a break and enjoy some C preprocessor, shall we? You can almost see uh, the C preprocessor like uh, a sed on a source file. There. Read this code and guess what it does. Sure, they are trying to get a safe divide of x by y. And it doesn't work. This macro is translated this way, which clearly isn't what was intended. Next. A very simple macro, square. I'll let you a sec to read it. Now, what could go wrong? Uh, yes, this will compile and yet this won't work as expected. Next, guess what this program does. 
yes, it does seem very simple. In fact, you cannot know. Everything here could have been changed in something that h. Let's see what is its content. Mm, nasty. <laughs> if now is a macro. And it could have been even worse. Let me introduce you to evil.h. Yes. Next, we have a very simple macro, a simple instruction saying that x equals zero. But when you use it, you don't see that it changes variable in your local scope. You just see a function call. And you know what? With macros, you can get C to a whole new level. What do you know about C? A very old imperative programming language? Nah. It's actually an oriented object programming language with generic data structures, and you can have polymorphic functions, and you can have interfaces. Everybody gets exceptions, thanks to libcello. They even had closures at some point. But there are some cons. No type checking. Thanks, but uh, no thanks. Satan. Now that we saw what could be done using macros, mostly things we really don't want since we cannot control debugging and other minor stuff like that, let's see how we can replace them. Let's see something familiar in C, macros. Macros help factoring redundant instructions. This is almost a search and replace. We also could have done static inline functions, but combine with macros. So we can have functions working on either integers or float. On the zig side, it looks a lot like inline functions in C, except that we have a simple function with the exact same syntax as any other function, taking a type as the first argument. This type is a value known as compilation, comp time, and it is used as a type of the other parameters. And if we want to limit the number of functions in our final binary, we could have used the keyword inline. Another way to use macros is to get generic structures. In this example, we create a list of items in a list structure. So for each type we want, we create a structure list underscore type. Here is the declaration of this list, and here is its first use. In Zig, we can have a function returning the structure we want. Uh, side note, this isn't mandatory. So as presented here, this feels like a very small improvement. In both versions, we still need to perform memory allocations, here and here. And this part is still related to the type of our structure. So this doesn't feel like a good abstraction. For now, I will show to you a real life example later. Finally, we use a preprocessor for conditional compilation, compiling only stuff we want. If this is defined somewhere in the code, then uh, only this will be compiled. Not this. 
on the zig side let's say that this is defined somewhere and then we have this since the switch is on a constant which is defined once during compilation there is no point to put other instructions than the right one in the binary so since my os here is actually this value we we will only have this and the same thing applies with functions if you are referring to constants defined at top level so you can have this switch in a function if you want and i also tried uh, some kind of stuff like that and it is completely useless but it works next optionals an optional is a value that can exist or not for example in zig here i have a variable named optional value which is an integer but may not exist right now this value doesn't exist it's null but beware that is not null as in c this is not zero in haskell you may do that with uh, maybe and uh, it is quite similar and to check uh, if there is a value you can do this conditional like this in c we have to hack a bit let's say that you have a variable x there and the function name some function and this function may change x so to be sure you need another variable so some function can tell you if the variable x was changed or if it is garbage another way is to return a pointer like this and if it is null then the value is garbage either way it's more complicated than it has to be next a quick one test in zig there is a test keyword allowing you to execute a block of code this is an example you have a function that you want to test of course and we have a test block which is named return true and this is a block of code so you can write pretty much anything in it and you can have as much test cases as you want directly in your original code to run the test you just have to do this if the test fails the zig compiler will provide the name of the test and an error stack trace let's see that oh no panic <laughs> so the test returns true failed and this is the stack trace next errors one of the best things in zig compared to c first in c it's how not you don't have errors in c you may have just integers or null pointers that's silly in zig errors are enumerations this is a possible error enumeration and in zig you have error unions a value can be either the actual value or an error actual value error exclamation mark let's see how this works in practice in c we'll get a value that is conventionally an error minus something or null 
then you will have to deal with it according to the manual to know the different possible errors and their value this way or you can just completely ignore errors this actually works and it is a massively flawed program <laughs> in zig function signatures tell the developers when a function is returning an error with this exclamation mark in this example the return can be either an error or just void and if i didn't put the error type it would have just mean any kind of error so now let's call the function there since the function may return an error we have to catch it in this example our error is named error and we switch on it and there we have all its possible values in case the error is unexpected there we will return the error then we assume that authentication error cannot happen which is explicit with the unreachable keyword in case our assumption is wrong and that an authentication error happens our application will crash at runtime most of the time we don't want to handle errors within our current function so we have a shortcut to propagate the error which will be handled later i think that uh, this kind of error management is crucial to simplify the c programming language so to finish with error management an example we have an application sample with a stack of functions with an error at the last function call first to fail so we have first our main function here that is calling last to fail that is itself calling second to fail that is itself calling first to fail that is actually failing each time the error is propagated try try and finally try even in the main function so this will create a runtime error so i compile the application and then i run it what is displayed first the error name unexpected then the complete error stack with first to fail second to fail last to fail and then main and each time we have the problem that occurred with the line and the related function there is no need to add any code to be able to create this error stack and it helps a lot we see how a program failed by default this isn't enough but it's great for the back and it even works on freestanding outstanding in any case when calling a function you will have either the value you ask for or the error that happened and if you have forgotten to handle an error the compiler won't compile your application the compiler will even tell you what you have missed next memory allocations and allocators in zig an allocator is a simple structure with a few functions to allocate and to free memory there are quite a few allocators and i'll show some of them in this video first we have to know how to use them an allocator has four main functions the first one is for asking memory for a single value then you will release its memory so create and destroy for a single value or you can ask for multiple value so will you will alloc memory which will give you a slice then you will have to free the memory so the first example we'll see is page allocator 
page allocator asks for a complete memory page each time we will ask for memory. A memory page is 4 kibibytes on Linux. In this example, we ask for three elements. Three elements of a single byte unsigned. Then we defer memory release at the end of the function, right here. We'll see the defer keyword in detail later. It only means doing stuff at the end of the function. Now we can use our slice just as we want. So when we run this example, we can see with S trace memory allocations. And like I said before, a world memory page of four kibibytes is allocated. If we change this example and we ask three times for memory, then we will ask for four kibibytes three times. There. This is inefficient, but this is a very simple memory allocator. Let's see a more general purpose allocator. Before using it, you can configure it to check for memory safety. This way it will check for double free, keeping track when memory was asked, then released for the first time, then the second time. So you can have a very useful debug information. It will also check for memory leaks, allowing you to know if you correctly released memory. It won't reuse memory slots, which, uh, which is a good thing for safety. And it works even in freestanding. Now we create an instance of this structure right here. So I configure it with safety. Then we say we want to deinitialize it at the end of the function, right here. Remember, defer, end of the function. When we deinitialize the structure, it will perform verifications I just told. A general purpose allocator is an overlay on top of an allocator. So to use the allocator, we get the inner structure right here. And then we can use this allocator just as the previous one. General purpose allocator isn't as simple as page allocator and certainly not as stupid. When we ask for multiple memory allocations, it won't get a new memory page each time. I will leave the details. Just check the code if you want to know more. Next, we have fixed buffer allocator, which is an allocator that doesn't allocate memory at all. It uses a fixed buffer that you provide for memory allocations, right here. So in this example, I create a buffer, which is an array of unsigned bytes filled with zeros a thousand times. So it's an array of a thousand zeros, single byte. I could have created the same buffer uninitialized this way, so it would have been filled with garbage values that you can find on the stack. Next, I create a fixed buffer allocator structure right here, and I give a slice of my wall array here. So the type checker is happy. A fixed buffer allocator have an inner allocator structure that we can get like this. And then we can use it just as any other allocator. So that is great for performances, but as we know, stack memory have limitations. And the last memory allocator I want to show is Arena. Arena allocator is an overlay on top of an allocator, page allocator in this case. Arena releases 
all allocated memory when we call for its dinit method right here. So at the end of the function, we don't need to call for destroy or free, and actually they will be ignored. This may seem like a useless allocator, but it is actually great. Some applications have quite a few allocations related to each other and may want to release all of them at once without the possibility for a memory leak. For example, a network application such as a web server may allocate memory for each request and their response with many small allocations and our application could free all the memory related to a request at once. Just by choosing this allocator, the ARENA allocator, you are sure not to have memory leaks. And that concludes what I wanted to show about memory allocators. It is a big part of what actually is great in ZIG to me. Last but not least, differ. The idea, just like we saw, is to perform some code before returning from a function. So you record a block of code that will be executed before the end of the function or the return statement. It is a useful, very simple, and yet intuitive feature of ZIG. Nothing new, absolutely nothing new, we already saw that in Go, for example, but still is just plain awesome to me. There is no usable feature like differency. Well, originally. I encountered something that tries to be differ, and the paper was published a few months ago, but that feels like an hack, since you don't just have a differ statement. You have non obvious corner cases, Guard blocks which aren't mandatory but blah blah blah. Sorry, Inria laboratory of Nancy, you fought well, but your differ is no match for the differ statement in Zig, period. So I'll still consider that there is no differ in C. In Zig, in our first example, we start with a differ block of code that will be executed at the end of the function. And the content of the function only is a print. Hello world. So this function will print hello world, then end of function. Moving on. In our second example, we have an early first statement, meaning that the block of code or expression, in this case, will be executed at the end of the function if and only if our current function returns an error. Then we have a differ statement here that will be executed at the end of the function. And finally, the content of the function actually is a try. So we will try some function. In case some function fails, first we will execute the differ statement, then the error differ one. Why? Because uh, differ and error differ statements are queued. So the last one, which is the differ one, will be executed first. And now let's see some zig awesomeness. Let's see this example. We want to perform two memory allocations, then run two functions that may fail. And we want to end the execution upon any failure, knowing which function failed. This translates to this. Each time a function fails, we have to remember to free previous allocations. Right here, then right here, then right here, for example. And there is no meaningful return. We just return a conventional negative integer with value depending on where the error occurred. So for the memory locations, 
minus 1 for the first function minus 2 for the second function minus 3 etc. None of that is necessary in Zig. The God is just way simpler. A friend of mine suggested that we could have used labels and go tos, but we quickly concluded that differs are better. But if you have a better way to handle this in the C part, uh, I'm open to suggestions. Finally, a kinda real life example. Let's see how to use a release from the standard library. We start with some grooming for our future code by defining a few constants helping us to keep our code clean without repeating std dot blah blah blah. In my examples, I will use these constant values. First example, I want to use array lists in an obvious and even naive implementation. I have a function taking an allocator as the only parameter. I declare an array list of unsigned 32-bit integers and initialize it with the provided allocator. Then, I want to free its content at the end of the function. Now, I add a value to the array list and since it involves an allocation, this may fail. If the allocation fails, I just want to return the error to the calling function. Nothing more, so I use the try keyword. Then I list the content of the error list. It should only print a single value at index 0. Finally, I pop the only value. This example is a result of everything I've shown to you. First, structures. We can create instances of structures and use their functions this way, which is way more readable than in C. Then, comp time. With comp time, we can create genetic structures by providing them a type in parameter. But comp time also helps to print stuff without requiring to put the type in the format, for example. Next, differ. No matter how complex our function will grow, we know for a fact that we have correctly handled memory allocations, and when the function ends, memory is freed. Next, errors. With a single keyword, we manage memory allocation errors, and this was the correct way to handle it, not an oversimplification. Also, since error management is explicit, developers can see in the code when an error may occur. In this example, the only error that can happen is, of course, when a memory allocation occurs. Finally, we have memory allocators. They enable you to choose a strategy to handle allocations, and structures within the standard library will comply. All memory allocations in this example may be thread safe or within a fixed buffer on the stack, for example, and this function won't change. All of that in this very simple example. Now, let's see a second example, a bit less naive, just to show a bit more of the standard library. This second example shows another strategy for memory allocations. No matter the chosen allocator, we start by allocating a lot of space. Then, since we know that memory allocation has happened correctly, we are sure that there is room for our value, and we add the value assuming the capacity. Then, just to show slices once again, we can add a slice to our hour list this way. Once again, I assume we have enough capacity. And finally, I print the items in the list. There is plenty of functions to manipulate the array list structure to implement whatever strategy you can think of. And you can have complex strategies expressed in a very simple way between the choice of the allocator and the way you handle the structures. But this is a matter for another video. And that will be it for today, folks. It's time for a conclusion. Okay, it's time for a quick summary. We saw that Zig improves most of C functionalities and syntax. Okay, for the new stuff we have Optionals, simplifying the code a bit. This functionality is coming in C++, but uh, with a way less user-friendly syntax. Next, we have test blocks. You can write a function 
and it's test in the same file. No big deal, just nice. Next we have comp time. It's a replacement for the preprocessor, allowing to use only a single language. This helps static code analysis. We also saw that it helps readability and that's the main part. Next we have error management. Errors are simple enumerations and the user has to check errors. They have to take it into account. And we have the try keyword for lazy people. So you can just propagate the error if you don't want to handle it in the same function. Next we have allocators. They are simple structures allowing to allocate our free memory. There are many allocators since there are many ways to manage memory. And most of all, the standard library uses provided allocator, meaning that you can choose a way to allocate memory and the standard library will comply. Next, we have defer. Defer, simple keyword allowing you to execute the code at the end of the function or at the end of the scope. Error defer is exactly the same but only when an error occurs. Both are dead simple and yet they improve code readability a lot. Finally, standard library. I didn't show much about it. Let's say it includes mostly what we can expect from it common and not so common structures, such as hashes, queues, linked lists, allocators, as we saw, and some operating system abstractions. So your code will work on most operating system and most architectures. Bonus and cross compilation works like this. So you can easily have your application compiled for Linux or ARM architecture using the muscle library for example, or for Windows, or for x86-64, uh, freestanding or muscle or GNU, or for R, or for browsers uh, with uh, WebAssembly. And it even works for ZigCC, so the ZigC compiler included in the Zig compiler. So check it out. Second bonus. Since the regular linker didn't work for all architectures, someone did a new linker. And uh, to me that proves that uh, developers pay attention to details. Also, this new linker will probably someday provide incremental linking, meaning that you can have a million lines of code and um, it will compile everything within a second. In conclusion, ZIG isn't production ready yet. Some features may change before 1.0. API changes a bit sometimes and documentation is lacking, but that's mature enough for early adopters, I think. The only improvement I really want to see is a replacement for poll, ePoll, QQ, select and IOCP for Windows users, such as libevent, but in the standard library. And that's it. The only thing. My opinion is that despite being minimal, uh, changes over C have massive implications. I think that languages uh, like C++, Java, Go, maybe even Rust, were created because of a few key problems in C. To me, what I've shown to you today in this video fixes C. So writing low level code finally is fun again and productive. And with Zig reaching maturity, I do think that a lot of people will join the party. Maybe someday we will see a language on top of Zig, similar to what MoonScript did to Lua or what LiveScript did to JavaScript and that will bring Zig to even more people. I really want to see that. Finally, a word on developers. Zig developers avoid new features like the plague and pay attention to details. That's it, and that's perfect. And since 
Zig Foundation isn't a commercial organization. I'm quite confident this project will thrive. And finally, here is a list of ideas for future videos. So if you are interested, please let me know. Thanks for your time. Thanks for watching. See you soon.